welcome to Legacy Church, our online service this morning. What a great day this is. It's Father's Day. It's the day when we celebrate fathers and we honour them. Now, we don't want to just honour fathers on Father's Day. We want to honour them every day. But this is a great opportunity for us to honour our dads. Now, I realise that for some of you, maybe growing up, it hasn't been that good with your dad. I realise that. And many of our dads maybe have passed on or not with you or estranged. I realise that. But for the others that are there with their families and trying their best to be that dad that they want to be, I just want to honour them and I want to thank them. And this morning we've got three great dads from our church, from Legacy Church. They're going to come and they're just going to share for a few minutes on what it means to be a dad. What do they like about being a dad? First we're going to have David come and then we'll have Ian and then we'll have Michael. So thank you. When I first became a parent, I was in a bit of a shock. I was not a Christian. And when I first saw my firstborn son, I went, wow, beep, beep. It's a miracle. His likeness is so much like me. And then I read in Genesis 1.20, where it reads, let us make man, plural, in our image. And I realized that God has given each of us a measure of of his creative traits. I also re realised the incredible and awesome responsibility of bringing up children in the ways of the Lord. And I thank God that he's blessed me as a father. All thanks and glory be to Jesus. Amen. Wow. Big question. What is it that I like so much about being a parent and being a father? Well, the endless breakfasts in bed, the endless sleep-ins. I've now got someone to mow the lawn. No, it's not really all that. And sometimes I might get the lawn mown, but it's not that big a deal. It's the joy of helping someone else grow, having their lives before them and helping guide them. And sometimes they even listen to me. And there's a lot of learning grace to be a parent. Near as much as there is grace being a child. Because part of being a parent is we grow as our children grow. And they grow as we grow. It's one of those amazing things. The only father who was truly perfect was our God. We still fail. We still try and get things right. But God's blessed us with children and we learn parenthood through being a parent. And God blesses us with that. The thing I like about being a father is the whole bringing a life into the world, or in my case, three lives into the world, um, and obviously my, um, the kid's mother has something to do with that too, but um, being a part of watching them grow and being involved in the development, the, as they grow and they hug you and they love you and um, when they start getting closer towards teenagehood and they, you know, they go through those stages where you know, it's not cool necessarily, but they still hug you and love you anyway. Um, helping them to... Um, grow in personal growth and also in terms of as they go through teenagehood and develop which mine is starting to do and making those decisions in life that are really key and important and just they look to you for help and assistance with that and they trust you um, it's a huge responsibility but oh my gosh it's a huge privilege as well Thank you. 
Oh uh-huh.
So God is definitely with us and he is also commonly known as our father. Um, and he has so many attributes of the father that his heart moves can be compassion, um, that he sent his son and for eternity, I wish my kids would genuinely sing of what I've done, but how much more so can we sing of what God our father has done? And Shane left us visiting us today, um, I guess virtually online, um, rather than in person, unfortunately, but he's going to come and talk to us about what it means to be a father. Good morning, church. Um, welcome this morning, wherever you are. Uh, as we know, we really find out at the moment the church is not a building. It's the people, and that's always the way it was meant to be. So we can connect, uh, regardless of being in a building together, at least we can connect, and we thank God for the technology that helps us to do that. This morning, we just want to say Happy Father's Day to all the dads, to all the granddads, to the great-granddads. Uh, we just say, well done. Um, we know, as a father myself, and as a grandfather myself, it's a huge role that we play and um, we just want to honour you this morning and say um, this is your special day and we just acknowledge you, we want to say we appreciate you and that we pray that you have a wonderful blessed day. Um, unfortunately we are in lockdown which means we're not going to second year in a row not be able to have family with us but God's face will be shining on you and his love is poured out for you and so I pray that you'll just have some comfort with that and still be able to have a nice meal and a, a relaxing time phone calls facetimes they're always a great way to connect at this particular time so happy father's day to every one of you who are celebrating this today I do want to acknowledge though that father's day is not always a, a day of celebration so we extend our love to anyone who's lost a father or a grandfather recently. Similarly, we send our comfort and love to the families who have been badly affected, maybe abandoned or abused by the man in the house. We just want to acknowledge your pain. I know that, uh, we will see, there were a, a couple of ladies who didn't come to our Father's Day service because of the pain of that. And we acknowledge that. Um, and, but we say to the dads, those who are doing a great job, well done, fantastic. The title of my message this morning is The Characteristics of a Godly Man or Father. You know, it's an unfortunate reality that there has been a gradual but definite decay of the family unit as God has created it. And as I've often said, if you have healthy families, you have a healthy community, healthy communities give you a healthy, um, wider suburb and state. And it just flows out. Where there's health, it flows out. And so I believe God created families to be healthy and full of love so that from generation to generation, that health is passed down. But unfortunately, we've seen a decay of that. We've, it's been an unfortunate reality uh, that... Males have had their colours lowered in a sense over the years because of all sorts of factors. You know, the domestic violence, physical, emotional abuse of women and children. Men are not always the perpetrators, but you know, we've got to take responsibility that a majority of those are from us. But what I do want to recognise this morning is that we are all fallen people living in a fallen world and that we struggle to love others like Jesus loves us. And rather than dwell on the past and the negative, it must be said that many men are doing great jobs out there in the community. And for those who are even doing a great job, at times it can seem to be a tough role to be able to do. So to begin this message this morning, I want to go to a passage that is not often used for a Father's Day message but I think you'll see why I chose it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are our Father and we give you praise and glory because you are the perfect Father. And this morning, Lord, we lift up all the dads, the granddads, the great-granddads. It might even be a great-great-granddad out there, but we lift them up to you and we thank you for them. 
We thank you for the significant role and influence they have had over families. We pray your blessing over them, your comfort and strength for them this morning as we celebrate them together. But also, Lord, I pray for all families, because I know that a lot of families, um, because of the fall, are broken. Um, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of hurt. Father, we pray for the healing of families this morning, for the strengthening of families. And we pray as we open the word this morning that you would give us insight into the power of your word. Your word brings us life. And so we ask your blessing on the reading of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 8, starting at verse 5. And it says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment. What an amazing encounter that we read here. You know, if we went back to Genesis and had time to look through Genesis, we would see that after the fall, God made man the, the spiritual head of the home. And the goal was to have someone over the family who would love, protect, provide for the family. And also we see as we read through different parts of the Old Testament to raise children in that same love and security and provision, to teach them how to be a dad, to teach them how to be a grandfather, and to teach them the ways of the Lord. In this reading taken from the Gospel of Matthew, we encounter this dialogue between Jesus and a centurion. From the scripture, we can infer that the centurion, though a Roman, is a godly man who has heard about Jesus and knows of his good deeds. We can even infer that he is full of mercy and compassion as he was there to plead the case of his servant. The centurion actually says to Jesus, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. He was a man of humility. He did not think that he deserved Jesus to even enter his home. And he said, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and I say, this one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does. You see, what the centurion had recognised, that living under authority gives you authority. He details this by stating that because he is under authority, he has the authority to tell those under him to go and they go and come and they come. Think of the army, think of the police, think of doctors. All have authority. You know, they have authority to be a soldier because they're given that authority by a higher authority. Police are the same. We see police out everywhere, but police have authority. They have authority to pull you over if you're speeding or they have authority to, you know, check if you're in the right place at the right time. Why? Because they've been given authority. And it's that authority that was given to them that gives them authority to carry out their duties. Doctors, look, you can look at anybody, even pastors, we come under authority. And it's only that authority. 
Problems arise, of course, when we overstep that authority and begin to bring our own agendas into the mix. But what we see with Jesus, he recognises that this is a man who knows what it is to operate out of the authority given him. And Jesus' response is, I have not seen. I was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Isn't it interesting that Jesus correlated the truth, the understanding and the operation of authority with faith. And he said, I have not seen such great faith. And the result, of course, was that he said, go, let it be done, just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed. So this morning, I want to talk about the authority that we have, the authority that we a call to exercise in our own lives as men, as, as the head of the family, uh, or for a grandfather to be more of a patriarch of the family. And what we're going to look at is what is the authority that has been given to us, but the first part is we understand where that authority comes from. That families were ordained by God himself, created by God for a purpose, and to bring health, and to bring love, joy and peace to the human community. You know, as a preacher, if I come to the day when I was aware that the Lord no longer gave me the authority to preach his word, I would stop preaching the word. And we could go through a myriad of practical examples this morning, but we don't have a lot of time, so let's concentrate on one. Our Supreme Commander, Someone said to me, I don't like the word supreme commander because some of the uh, countries overseas where they have a supreme commander uh, makes them think a bit evil. But the reality is we do have a supreme commander and that is our Lord. And he gave us one command. In John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus shifted the goalposts a little bit on love. You see, in the Old Testament, we read that we were to love the Lord God with all our heart and soul and mind and to love others as we love ourselves. That could be a bit hazy, couldn't it? Because some people don't like themselves. And so when we talk about loving others as we love ourselves, that can be a little bit tricky. So Jesus lifted the bar and he said, I want you to love others as I have loved you. And if we had more time again this morning, we could list all the ways he shows his love for us. And I encourage you, Matt, to do that as a small group this week. Get together in twos and threes and just make a list of all the ways Jesus has shown that he loves us. It's a great little activity. You know, the things like we could talk about his willingness to go to the cross for us. We could talk about his willingness to take our effort out of the equation and rely on what he has done for us, for our salvation. Now, here's the best part of the deal. Since Jesus, our Lord, and King of Kings has given us this mandate to love. We can do three things with that. Firstly, we could ignore the command and continue to love according to our needs, our wants and our feelings, love the way the world loves. Secondly, we could take up the challenge that Jesus has given us and try to do it in our own brokenness and strength. And even as Christians, many of us try to do that and we wonder why it's not working out the way we hoped. Or finally, we can come under his authority, submit to his leadership, and then allow the Holy Spirit to bring healing to our own hearts so that we can allow the transformation of our hearts to take place, equipping and enabling us to love like Jesus loves. Isn't that the better option? 
I don't know about you, the third option is the best option. But the first part of that is to come under his authority. To, to love as he's commanded us to love. To love not to get something back. Because Jesus was a sacrificial giver. He is a servant king. And he gives. And he gives. And so he says, if you come under my authority, I will equip you to give. I will so fill your heart with love, you'll have it more than enough to bubble over. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all of the fruit becomes available in our life without our striving, without trying to do it in our own strength. It's just a part of the Holy Spirit working in us, transforming us. You see, I believe if we have the desire to be the best son, I'm talking mainly to males today because it's Father's Day, but everyone can take this on board. But if you desire to be the best son, the best sibling, the best boyfriend, the best husband, father, grandfather that we can be, then it starts with your relationship with the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You see, in Africa, they have this beautiful saying that says, we are before we do. So often, we, we think, this is a great, we try to do it before we've allowed God to do the work in us to transform us. We are before we do. If we rely on our own capabilities, no matter how good our intentions, our brokenness and our fleshly desires and our frailties will be a stumbling block for us. It takes more than our own strength. It takes more than physical strength to do the right thing at the right time. You know, it's more courageous and requires more strength sometimes to do what is right rather than what pleases us or what our feelings try to dictate to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10, we read this. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he says, therefore, he just talked about all the, the wonderful visions and that he had in Christ. And it says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, said Paul, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Paul signifies the difference between physical strength and spiritual strength. Unfortunately, over the years, uh, many men have tried to get their authority from the way they build up their bodies or the position that they have in a job or, or the, the authority that's given them worldly. And yet, Paul is bringing us back to our authorities not in physical strengths, not in our positions, not in any of those things. Our strength is in Jesus Christ. You see, he is showing us that Physically, he had this thorn in his flesh. It says a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that thorn is, but it obviously annoyed him. It was painful to him. He said it was, it was, uh, uh, tormented him. <laughs> and yet he said, when he brought it to the Lord and said, you know, God, can you please take this away? The Lord said, no. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, the, the trouble is when we try to do things in our own strength, when we try to do things in our own wisdom, and we try to do things in our own ways, it's us. It's us. With all our frailties, with everything else that goes forward, we're trying to do it in that place, and it wears us out. But Paul says there's a supernatural power available for us. That God says... My grace is sufficient for you. 
when you understand your weaknesses, when we understand our frailties, and we give them to God, we come under his authority, we submit them to God. It says, God says in this passage, he says, therefore, uh, he says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power. God's power is made perfect in weakness. What a beautiful thing to understand. We don't have to prove ourselves to anyone. We just have to acknowledge where we're at, what we've been doing, and give it to God and say, God, I'm struggling with this. I find it hard to do this, but I know that the goal is to love others as you have loved me, and I struggle with that. I struggle with my temper. I struggle with anger. I struggle with this. I struggle with that. And God says, when we start to give him our weaknesses, his grace will begin to flow in our lives. And his power will begin to flow in our lives. And we start to see our lives begin to twist and turn. You see, what Paul is highlighting here is there's a difference between the natural and the supernatural. The world works in the natural realm. But as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, as those who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us to empower us, to counsel us, to transform us, we step into that supernatural realm. God's power begins to flow out of us in ways that we cannot even imagine. God's grace is sufficient for the one who is willing to admit their weakness. He says that when he experiences weakness in the flesh, he then experiences the power of Christ. When we surrender to him, in fact, Paul actually says he delights in his weaknesses so that he can receive strength from the Lord, then we have strength to overcome. In the army, when the army signs you up, they train you, they equip you, they provide whatever weapons you need to go into whatever battle they take you, they give you everything you need. Well, when God calls you, he trains you, he heals you, he equips you, and he gives you access to his incomparably great power for those who believe. So let's just recap on some key points. God created and ordained families to be loving, nurturing, healthy, and duplicatable under his authority. And that's why I feel God gave me this message this morning. Because we're standing in a world, I'm not blaming anyone, but right now we stand in a world that's broken. We stand in a world where families are being broken apart. There's pain, there's hurt. All those things that God wanted us to to nurturing a family are being taken away. And we understand why. The devil comes to rob, steal and destroy. But Christ has come to give us life. And it's time for us not to just be filled with shame of what happened in the past. Let's let go of that. This is not a message of shame. This is not a message of condemnation. This is a message that says, there is a better way. And, and, and for men and women, but when we stand up under the authority that we have in Christ Jesus, when we come under that authority and we begin to operate in that authority, we will bring change. It might be just one little bit at a time, but we can bring change. And I believe this is the time for change. This is an opportunity for us to stand up and say, well, it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter all my mistakes. Right now, I can bring about change by coming back through the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when Adam and Eve fell, it was because they stepped out from God's authority. And the first thing that happened, family breakdown, jealousy, anger, and murder in the first generation. And the consequences over the years have been the family breakdowns, man losing their identity of who they were. We began to see physical strength and domineering attitude as power and leadership. 
Love has been superseded by lust and selfishness. But then Jesus came back into the picture and gave us a clear representation of what love looks like, what strength looks like, what hope looks like, what power looks like. And it's not power to conquer someone, not power to lord it over someone, but power to love, power to forgive, power to actually see people's lives changed because love is the key. The Bible says love never fails, never gives up. Jesus had a close relationship, total reliance on the Father. He felt so loved by the Father that he wanted to share that love with us in practical and sacrificial ways. So he came to the cross and died on our behalf. He had an inner strength which allowed the characteristics of love, grace and mercy to flow from him. Jesus was the epitome of a man who knew his identity, knew his calling, knew his position in Christ. And he lived his life out of that identity. And he wants to give you and I an identity too. We're sons and daughters. Those who believe in Christ are now called sons and daughters. And he says, go out into all the world and be my witnesses. Starting in Jerusalem, working your way out. In, in some sense, he says, start in your own family. Be the epitome of love for your own family. And if there has been breakdown, then blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who come and bring healing as we pray as we seek after God, as we keep giving love, the Bible says never give up doing good for at the right time you will reap a harvest. I've seen people who have decided to love and suddenly things change. I've seen marriages healed, reconciliations of fathers and sons. As we come under Christ's authority, I was in a, a meeting one day where an old man was there praying and, and we prayed for the Holy Spirit to come upon him. He, he gave his heart to the Lord that day and, and he went away and he was a smile on his face. He was down beat when he came in. He was smiling and he came back a day later and he said, you never guess what happened. He said, my son, whom I have not seen, I think it was for about 18 years, they'd been totally pulled apart because his fiance had spread a lie about him. And, and so the, their relationship was fractured. He never saw him. The very night he gave his heart to the Lord and forgave his son, his son rang up and said, I forgive you, Dad. I know now that it wasn't true and I want to come and see you and make things right. That's the power of God. The power of God when we submit to him. As that old man submitted his his unforgiveness as he submitted his hurts and pains to God and came under his authority, God went to work in that situation and brought healing and restoration. You see, love never fails. I don't know what your situation is like at the moment or whether you feel condemned by mistakes in the past. I don't know whether you've been wounded by men in your life. What I do know is that we cannot live in the past or dwell on past mistakes. We cannot give up on our families or think that we can never make amends, that things can't get better. The beauty of our relationship with Jesus is that where there is a genuine heart's desire, he can make all things new and bring beauty out of ugliness. This morning, I, I, I wanted to, us to face some reality, but then look for change. I, I wanted us to see that Christ not only brought us love, but he also brought us forgiveness and hope and grace and mercy and peace and the promise of new beginnings. And don't we need it now in this time? It's so easy to look at the mountains and start to shrink, just like the Israelites, the 12 spies that went out, 11 of them came back, or 10 of them came back, and all they could see were the giants in the land. And their hopes shrunk. Joshua and Caleb said, well, with God with us, we can do this. Let's go. 
And that's the difference, is not to be overwhelmed by what's going on around you or what's happened, but to put your hope in a God that can make all things new. God that can bring us the grace and mercy to strengthen us. You know, if we, all of us, not just men, are willing to come under his authority afresh, he will train us, equip us, and empower us. We live in a society where people don't like being under authority. If we are under his authority, he will give us the authority to resist the plans of the enemy, to take a stand against worldly desires and live a life of love, being transformed in ever increasing glory into the likeness of the sun. Now is not a time for doom and gloom and inactivity. This is a time for us to shine. This is a time for us to get back in the battle against the powers and principalities and to be part of the healing of our families. As families get healed, communities will be healed and the rippling effect will go out. We need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Let's come under his authority and live by faith as his sons and daughters. Our God loves us. He loves you. He loves you with such a passion. And it pains him to see all the heartbreak around. But you know, he came to give us life and life to the full. I say this, let's choose life. Let's choose love. Let's choose to come under his authority. Let's choose to make a difference. Let's choose to leave a legacy of love for those who come behind us. And it doesn't matter what you've done up to today, you can change everything. His mercies are new every morning. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you this morning that you are with us, always with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Father, that you are love. And so when we talk about being in you and you in us, it is all about love. And Father, we need help to love like you love us. We've been brought up in the world's way of loving. We've been brought up in brokenness and fallenness. But today we say our God is making all things new. I pray again for your blessing upon every father, grandfather, and great-grandfather today. Father, strengthen them, encourage them by your spirit. But Father, further than that, for every man, woman, and child this morning, I pray that they would have a fresh revelation of the love that you have for them. I pray that, Lord, that you would give us the heart desire to no longer try to do things in our own strength or in our own ways, but to come back under your authority, where, Lord, you will lead us and guide us, equip us, empower us. You will bring us into that place of light and love in Jesus' name. I pray healing for families today. If there is any brokenness in families, I pray for the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and restore and redeem. I pray that you'll bring hope where there seems to be hopelessness. There will be peace where there is turmoil presently. That, Lord, you will be their provider, their comforter. Lord, Father, that you will lead them out of the valley and into the, the sunshine once again, where we can enjoy our relationship with you and our relationship with each other again. And I pray for anyone who's listening this morning that perhaps you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. What a beautiful time to come. Because even though it's Father's Day for all our men around the place, it's also our Father in Heaven that we give praise and glory to as well. And everything we've talked about this morning as far as His empowering, His love, His grace, His mercy is available to you too. All you need to do is receive it from him. Jesus came on a mission to save us out of our sinfulness. In fact, 
as he started his ministry, he said, I, I've been Lord, anointed to preach the good news, to heal the sick, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to set the captives free. And that's what Jesus is offering each and every one of us still today. And so, if you have never received Jesus, but you want to know more about him, you can contact Pastor Margaret at the church if you want to know more about Jesus. Or if you just want to say, I want to know Jesus now, then you can say a simple prayer yourself, which is just really say, God, I recognize that I am a sinner and I repent of those sins and receive your forgiveness in my life. And I choose from today to come into your realm, to invite you into my heart and to lead me and guide me into fruitfulness, into that place of love that I won't find anywhere else. You know, it doesn't matter what the words are. It doesn't matter how articulate you are. If your heart's desire is to know Jesus, then just say that to him. I want to know my Jesus. And if you've done that for the first time, I encourage you to get in touch with Pastor Margaret. And they'll give you a Bible. They'll give you some information to help you grow in your new faith in Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you all today. Again, I pray for all the, the, the dads and that. It's locked down, but may God's blessing be upon you. May you know his love surrounding you in Jesus' name.
special Father's Day service to an end, but our fellowship together doesn't have to end because as usual we are meeting on Zoom. So if you're unfamiliar with where everything is, if you're on a mobile phone, if you look down below there, there should be a little button saying to go to the Zoom meeting. And if you're on the computer or on an iPad or something like that, it's going to be off to the side there. So if you just click on that, that'll take you into the meeting and it'll be great to catch up with you all. See ya.